hello fellow followers of Christ and welcome to the show that introduces you to the men and women behind history's greatest works of literature. Come along every week as we explore these renowned authors, the times and genre in which they wrote, why scholars praise their writing and how we as Catholics should read and understand their works. I'm Joseph Pierce and this is the authority. Hello and welcome to this episode of The Authority. Um, and this time we're going to, to perhaps remind ourselves of Monty Python uh, and say, and now for something completely different. Because uh, we've looked at Catholic writers such as the convert Richard Crashaw. Uh, recently, and William Shakespeare before that, and even Catholic saints, because uh, we had St. Robert Southall. But now we enter a new era, uh, and um, we, we look, we're looking this week at John Milton, who was certainly not a Catholic, and indeed was very anti-Catholic um, throughout his life. Um, he was very much in support of the Puritans during the English Civil War, uh, and following the victory of the Puritans, advocated and defended publicly uh, through his the power of his pen, the uh, regicide, the, the the crime of regicide, the, the the killing of the king, the execution of King Charles II in 1848. Uh, he was uh, beheaded. Um, that Milton publicly defended that action um, against the horror that it in, in, that it uh, caused throughout the world. Uh, he remained a, a staunch supporter of the uh, Puritan cause, even uh, after the vast majority of people had become completely disillusioned with it. As with most, uh, shall we say, ideologically driven revolutions, uh, the the Puritan revolution that was victorious in the English Civil War so soon dissolved into tyranny uh, and terror um, and totalitarianism. Uh, and became increasingly unpopular. So that following the uh, the death of Oliver Cromwell, who basically set himself up as the as the tyrannical dictator of of England, um, Lord Protector, to give him the name he gave himself. Um, when he died, things very quickly dissolved, or devolved into a state of anarchy. Uh, and so when in 1660 there was the restoration of the monarchy with uh, Charles II uh, coming to the throne, most people in England, even those who had initially supported the, the, uh, the, the, the parliamentarians in the war uh, and the Commonwealth, as it was called, uh, were rejoiced. The restoration was almost universally popular, but not with militant ideologues such as John Milton, who was very depressed by the restoration of the monarchy. Uh, and it's it's perhaps significant that he writes his greatest work and the work for which he's part of this series, for which he's part of the Western canon, and rightly lauded as one of the greatest writers in the English language ever, his epic, uh, Paradise Lost, was written around the time of the restoration of the monarchy. So it's when Milton is very much in low spirits, um, and that, that perhaps is something we should take into account. But the anti-Catholicism is certainly present in uh, in, 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 in uh, Paradise Lost, but it's not, of course not primarily about that. It's uh, it's using the form of the epic, so following uh, uh, the example of, of Homer's Iliad and Odyssey and Virgil's Aeneid um, to retell the story of the fall of Adam and Eve and, and Lucifer's role in that and the role of, of obviously of divine providence of God the Father, God the Son, uh, all characters in this epic narrative. So it's, it's, you might, it could be called uh, the Christian epic, perhaps the Christian epic par excellence if we don't want to give the divine comedy the title of, of, of epic. It's perhaps the, the, the pinnacle of, of Christian epic. However, it's not without uh, being controversial because there are some who claim that it's not really in the truest orthodox sense of the word a Christian poem at all. Um, there was a, 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 a document um, that most people accept was, was, it was written by Milton in which he basically uh, confesses himself to be an Arian 
Um, Arianism was was a, a major heresy of the early church, um, which basically denied the divinity of Christ. So Milton, um, in this in in the, this document, was discovered after his death. Basically, calls Christ a creature; he's not co-equal with the Father, um, uh, and th- therefore. Um, uh, He's not a Trinitarian, doesn't believe in the Trinity. He's not, doesn't believe in the Incarnation because if, if God the Son is, is, is not God, <laughs> if the Son is not God, then, uh, then God is not incarnate in, 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 in the person of Jesus Christ, but merely a creature. So this, this is Arianism. Um, it's a heretic. Of course, heresy has been condemned by the church. Is Milton an Arian? Well, most people, uh, including his greatest defenders, such as C.S. Lewis, and we'll talk about that a bit more deeply uh, in, in, in a moment, uh, seem to accept that, 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 that it's a genuine uh, document by Milton. So it, it seems inescapable that Milton was, to, to use a blunt word, but an accurate one, if he's indeed an Arian, Milton was a heretic. Uh, he's not a Protestant. Um, he's not a Christian uh, in, in the sense that surely... Uh, in, in C.S. Lewis's understanding of mere Christianity, uh, the highest common factors of what makes someone a Christian is certainly, surely, a belief in the Trinity, uh, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost as being ultimately one in three persons, uh, or and the incarnation of God uh, in the person of, uh, of Jesus Christ. Um, if you don't believe in, in the Trinity and the incarnation, surely you're not. A Christian. So, anyway, this is very controversial because those who defend Milton and defend Paradise Lost as as the uh, the, the, uh, the perfect or the ultimate great Christian epic are obviously not happy that to, to call Milton anything other than the Christian. So, um, Paradise Lost, if you like, has been put on trial on the basis of whether or not in the poem uh, there are there's evidence of this Arianism. And uh, certainly, uh, I, for one, um, believe that there is. Uh, it seems to me that um, the sun in the the, the poem is uh, comes after the father. He's a creature. Uh, it's even uh, possible that he comes after Lucifer in terms of creation. That's absolutely arguable. But certainly Lucifer's envy seems to be based upon the fact that this new fangled thing called the sun is, 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 is a, an upstart, a usurper, um, that, that somehow the father has, has a new favorite. And th- so that's the aspect of, 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 of the role of the sun in Paradise Lost, which I take as being very problematic. However, people who are greater minds than I have defended the poem, uh, and not least of of, of, of of whom is uh, is C.S. Lewis, who in many ways serves as Milton's most powerful defense attorney. And in his preface to Paradise Lost, he does his best to claim that although he accepts that Milton um, probably was an Arian in his private beliefs, he states that basically because Milton could, uh, could not have espoused Arianism uh, in his own time, he was conforming in the poem to Christian orthodoxy. Um, Lewis gives reasons for that. And for those who are interested, obviously you can read uh, a preface to Paradise Lost, but I edited a, a magazine called um, the St. Austin Review, and a, a, a new issue of it is um, a, a, on the theme of the mere genius of C.S. Lewis. And there's an, there's an article in there by Nathan Long, Longacre in which he gives... Uh, Lewis's defense of Milton's Paradise Lost at great length. So if you want to if you want to go deeper and pick up Lewis's book Preface to Paradise Lost and 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 pick up the St. Austin Review and Nathan Long Long Longacre's uh, article on Lewis's defense of Paradise Lost that's the case for the defense. I'm not going to spend too much time on the case for the prosecution in terms of whether or not the son in the poem is God or not whether he's divine or not. Um, uh, what I w- what I am more concerned with is the 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 way that Milton depicts Satan, um, and I, I'm going to talk about that because that for me is the dark the dark heart of um, of the poem because it's, it's it is 
really the, the dark core of Paradise Lost, the, the looming and alluring presence of Milton Satan, whose powerfully portrayed characterization has elicited sympathy from many readers of the poem. From Percy Shelley's eulogizing of him in the early 19th century um, to modern manifestations of sympathy for him in our own time. So Shelley basically states that, um, I think in his defense of poetry, that uh, Milton's Satan is so obviously morally superior to his God. Now, no doubt at all, Milton would be horrified that anybody could could read the poem that way, but the fact that a poet uh, such as Percy Shelley can do so certainly suggests that there's an, an element uh, of, uh, of believability in it. Um, with respect to more modern manifestations of sympathy for Milton's Satan, Milton's Lucifer, uh, there was an article in The Atlantic in March 2017 which discussed the fascination that Americans feel for the character in Lucifer in Milton's epic and how it manifests itself in the characterization of thoroughly modern anti-heroes on contemporary television, especially in The Sopranos, Mad Men and Breaking Bad, all of which are seen to reflect in some manner the dark side of the American dream. The morbid, This morbid fascination with Milton's archetypal anti-hero prompts Simon uh, the author of that article, to ask a provocative question. What's so American about John Milton's Lucifer? That's a, a provocative question indeed. There is, however, another provocative question that most m must be asked if we are to avoid misunderstanding and misconstruing Milton's Satan. Regardless of how American he is, we need to ask how Christian he is. So again, you know, we talked about metaphysical poetry and Milton is a metaphysical poet um, even though he's using the, the, the epic form here he writes other lyrical poet, poet poems which are certainly in the absolutely in the metaphysical mode of the conceit the apparent contradiction the apparent conflict that's resolved uh, in, 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 in deeper meaning and a deeper truth um, so can how can we talk about Satan being Christian <laughs> at the heart of such a question is a paradox from an orthodox Christian perspective, the real Satan is, at one and the same time, uh, a Christian and an anti-Christian. He is a Christian in the sense that he knows that Christ is the incarnate Son of God. He is an anti-Christian because he hates the Son as he hates the Father. He knows the Trinitarian God and he hates him. He is not an unbeliever. He is a rebel who is at war with the reality in which he has no choice but to believe. We think perhaps of, uh, of Dracula um, in, the, in, in the movies. So the demons in the gospel do not deny the authority of Christ. They defy him as far as they are able and despise him, but they do not and cannot deny him. We see the same paradox in the manner in which Dracula in the old movies recoils in horror from the sight of a crucifix. He hates the symbol of the power of Christ, but he cannot help but retreat from it because the power he despises is real. The problem with Milton's Lucifer is that he is not synonymous with the Lucifer of the Bible or the Lucifer of Christian tradition. He is a figment of Milton's heterodox imagination. Milton's God is not the Trinitarian God of the Christians, but a Unitarian God whose Son is a mere creature, albeit the greatest of all creatures. Considering Milton's theological break with orthodoxy, his denial of the Trinity, and in consequence his denial of the Incarnation also, it is, a grievously, erron it is grievously erroneous to see Paradise Lost as a Christian work. Except for its biblical trappings, it is no more Christian in an orthodox sense than the earlier epics of Homer and Virgil, and arguably less so. It might be argued, for instance, as we have done earlier uh, in this series, that Homer and Virgil were groping in the right direction towards the light of the gospel, whereas Milton, rejecting the church and the traditions of Christendom, was groping in the wrong direction, away from the light of the gospel. Homer and Virgil might be seen as virgins awaiting the coming of the bridegroom, whereas Milton is the disgruntled divorcee who turns his back on the marriage. 
regardless of whether William Blake was right when he said of Milton that he was, quote, of the devil's party without knowing it, Milton was indubitably doing the real Diabolus a service in inventing a mythical devil who has proved so attractive. Milton's Lucifer has what he perceives to be a just grievance and rebels against the perceived injustice with great courage. By way of contrast, it is hard to feel much sympathy with Milton's God, who is not loved because he is not lovable. He is an omnipotent Puritan prig, who is right because of his might. A Pharisee himself, he might well have been the sort of God whom the Pharisees worshipped, but he has little in common with the God of the Christians. Meanwhile, Milton's son is not worshipped because he is not God. In marked contrast to the biblical Jesus, he is depicted by Milton as a warrior who boasts of his martial prowess. It's a little wonder that an atheist such as Bercy Bichelli could claim that Milton's Satan was morally superior to his God. Perhaps nobody in history has done more to evoke sympathy for the devil than John Milton, even though we may presume that he would have been appalled at this dark side of his legacy. Here you see our modesty um, uh, being robust in my... Uh, role as uh, uh, as the prosecution attorney uh, and, and of course, of course um, uh, aware that I have no, no lesser person than, than, than C.S. Lewis uh, uh, to argue against me and I've, I've given you where you can read that so I'm not um, uh, I'm trying to just give one side of the story here. In answer to the original provocative question, Milton's Lucifer is not Christian. He is no more Christian than a poet who gave him life. In consequence, those who feel that they have sympathy for the Miltonian devil are not sympathising with the real Satan any more than they are rebelling against the real Christ. They are merely pursuing the shadows of Milton's dark and unenlightened theology. So, a little bit of controversy. And there's nothing wrong with a little bit of controversy. Um, I want to, however, um, do justice to Milton in one sense that he... In certain aspects of that of Paradise Lost, it's a beautiful poem, beautiful English. He's a great writer. His evocation of marital love, particularly uh, you know it, it, prior to the fall um, between Adam and Lee, Eve, is is beautiful. Um, uh, it is really uh, you know, and, and I'm even willing to accept the plausibility that the God that's depicted in Paradise Lost is Trinitarian. And that Christ is not a creature. I, 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 there's certainly ambivalence and ambiguity, and it's arguable. Um, and uh, Lewis certainly is very ingenious in the arguments that he offers to uh, to to vindicate that position. But there still is the problem of Milton's Satan. Compare Milton's Satan with, for instance, um, uh, Dante's. Uh, Dante, of course, is a Thomist in theology, a Catholic uh, in faith. Uh, and for Milton, for, for Dante, uh, S- Satan is trapped in a sea of ice in the bottom bottommost pit of hell, furthest away from heaven, insatiably hungry and devouring the traitors uh, forever, um, uh, and then excreting them and devouring them again. Um, this, this this person who now uh, his 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 pride has made him insatiably hungry to feed upon the evil uh, of which he is himself a slave, uh, a static figure unable to move beyond the point in hell to which God has assigned him. Compare that with Milton's Satan, Milton's Lucifer, who is a a courageous leader who who goes on a solo mission when all the rest of the demonic fallen angels uh, cower in in, in fear of the power of God. He goes on a one-man mission against all the odds uh, to carry out a mission to uh, um, to to uh, make of man allies against God. Uh, the the very martial war imagery, uh, the, the boastfulness of cry of, of of sorry of the son, 
uh, on occasions uh, of his power is is not the meekness, the self giving, sacrificial love of of, of Jesus. Um, there are problems, and uh, and I think that we need to um, acknowledge those problems, and we need to at least uh, listen to the witnesses for the prosecution, um, such as William Blake who says that Milton was of the devil's party without knowing it, or Percy Shelley, who's the atheist, uh, who finds more sympathy for, for, for Milton's Satan, who he sees as being morally superior to, to uh, Milton's God. Mary Shelley in Frankenstein basically has, uh, as, this, as, as the inspiration for, for the poem, uh, the, the monster um, has the same... Uh, um, antagonism towards his creature, to, towards his creation, as as Milton's Adam and more to the point Milton's Satan do towards their creator, that he blames uh, um, his creator for the suffering that he is uh, undergoing. So the and then again, as as the article in the Atlantic said, this this whole cult of the anti-hero, um, the dark, rebellious um, figure who who um, is somehow gains some nobility in his war on authority. Um, this is all part of a Miltonian shadow that has fallen in the wake of Milton's poem. And I personally see it as a consequence of Milton's own uh, dark theology, um, irrespective of his Arianism, which is dark enough in itself, his Puritanism, uh, his hatred of Catholicism, uh, which does manifest itself in certain aspects of, of Paradise Lost, um, in his willingness to advocate the execution of the king, um, his, his um, almost well, obstinate refusal to see the evils of uh, of Oliver Cromwell's puritanical, t- puritanical regime. So, uh, looking at the authority of John Milton, we see that it's a darkened authority that questions authentic authority, and perhaps the work itself is a consequence of that dark questioning of authentic authority um, by Milton himself. I would like to finish, however, on a lighter note because Milton did write some wonderful poetry, and uh, in uh, you know, we're featuring in the authority appropriate enough when we're looking at the poems, the book uh, that I have edited and compiled for Tan Books, Poems Every Catholic Should Know. And there is a short selection of poetry by Milton here um, uh, three poems, uh, one at a solemn music. Another on the religious memory of Mrs. Catherine Thompson, my Christian friend, deceased December the 16th, 1646. But I'm going to read, uh, by way of concluding this episode with the authority, Milton's poem On Time. And you will see it. it's very much a metaphysical poet with, uh, with a lot of uh, the use of metaphysical conceits within it. On Time by John Milton. Fly, envious time, till they run out thy race. Call on the lazy, leaden-stepping hours, whose speed is but the heavy plummet's pace, and glut thyself with what thy womb devours, which is no more than what is false and vain, and merely mortal dross. So little is our loss, so little is thy gain. For when, as each thing bad thou hast entombed, and last of all thy greedy self consumed, then long eternity shall greet our bliss with an individual kiss, and joy shall overtake us as a flood when everything that is sincerely good and perfectly divine with truth and peace and love shall ever shine about the supreme throne of him to whose happy making sight alone when once our heavenly guided soul shall climb then all this earthly grossness quit 
Attired with stars, we shall forever sit, triumphing over death and chance and thee, O time. Thank you so much. It's been a joy and a pleasure to spend this time with you in this episode of The Authority. Please do join me next time. Uh, Until then, goodbye and God bless. This has been an episode of The Authority with Joseph Pierce, brought to you by TAN. For updates on new episodes and to support The Authority and other great free content, Visit theauthoritypodcast.com to subscribe and use coupon code AUTHORITY25 to get 25% off your next order, including books, audiobooks, and video courses by Joseph Pierce on literary giants such as Tolkien, Chesterton, Lewis, Shakespeare, and Belloc, as well as Tan's extensive catalog of content from the saints and great spiritual masters to strengthen your faith and interior life. To follow Joseph and support his work, Check out his blog and sign up for email updates and exclusive content at jpierce.co. And thanks for listening.